Part three of the Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Newfeld. Chapter twelve. How many kinds of soldiery there are, and concerning mercenaries. Having discoursed particularly on the characteristics of such principalities as in the beginning I proposed to discuss, and having considered in some degree the causes of their being good or bad, and having shown the methods by which many have sought to acquire them and to hold them, it now remains for me to discuss generally the means of offence and defence which belong to each of them. We have seen above how necessary it is for a prince to have his foundations well laid, otherwise it follows of necessity he will go to ruin. The chief foundations of all states, new as well as old or composite, are good laws and good arms, and as there cannot be good laws where the state is not well armed, it follows that where they are well armed they have good laws. I shall leave the laws out of the discussion, and shall speak of the arms. I say, I say, therefore, that the arms with which a prince defends his state are either his own, or they are mercenaries, auxiliaries, or mixed. Mercenaries and auxiliaries are useless and dangerous, and if one holds his state based on these arms he will stand neither firm nor safe, for they are disunited, ambitious, and without discipline, unfaithful, valiant before friends, cowardly before enemies. They have neither the fear of God nor fidelity to men and destruction is deferred only so long as the attack is. For in peace one is robbed by them, and in war by the enemy. The fact is, they have no other attraction or reason for keeping the field than the trifle of a stipend, which is not sufficient to make them willing to die for you. They are ready enough to be your soldiers whilst you do not make war, but if war comes they take themselves off, or run from the foe which I should have little trouble to prove, for the ruin of Italy has been caused by nothing else than by resting all her hopes for many years on mercenaries, and although they formerly made some display and appeared valiant amongst themselves, yet when the foreigners came they showed what they were. Thus it was that Charles, King of France, was allowed to seize Italy with chalk in hand, and he who told us that our sins were the cause of it told the truth but they were not the sins he imagined, but those which I have related, and as they were the sins of princes, it is the princes who have also suffered the penalty. I wish to demonstrate further the infelicity of these arms. The mercenary captains are either capable men, or they are not. If they are, you cannot trust them, because they always aspire to their own greatness, either by oppressing you, who are their master, or others contrary to your intentions. But if the captain is not skilful, you are ruined in the usual way. And if it be urged that whoever is armed will act in the same way, whether mercenary or not, I reply that when arms have to be resorted to, either by a prince or a republic, then the prince ought to go in person and perform the duty of a captain. The republic has to send its citizens, and when one is sent who does not turn out satisfactorily, it ought to recall him, and when one is worthy, to hold him by the laws so that he does not leave the command. And experience has shown princes and republics single-handed making the greatest progress, and mercenaries doing nothing except damage, and it is more difficult to bring a republic, armed with its own arms, under the sway of one of its citizens, than it is to bring one armed with foreign arms. Rome and Sparta stood for many ages armed and free. The Switzers are completely armed and quite free. Of ancient mercenaries, for example, there are the Carthaginians, who were oppressed by their mercenary soldiers after the first war with the Romans, although the Carthaginians had their own citizens for captains. After the death of Epaminondas, Philip of Macedon was made captain of their soldiers by the Thebans, and after victory he took away their liberty. Duke Filippo being dead, the Milanese enlisted Francesco Sforza against the Venetians, and he, having overcome the enemy at Caravaggio, allied himself with them to crush the Milanese, his masters. 
His father, Sforza, having been engaged by Queen Johanna of Naples, left her unprotected, so that she was forced to throw herself into the arms of the King of Aragon in order to save her kingdom. And if the Venetians and Florentines formerly extended their dominions by these arms, and yet their captains did not make themselves princes, but have defended them, I reply that the Florentines in this case have been favoured by chance, for of the able captains, of whom they might have stood in fear, some have not conquered, some have been opposed, and others have turned their ambitions elsewhere. One who did not conquer was Giovanni Acuto and since he did not conquer, his fidelity cannot be proved. But every one will acknowledge that had he conquered, the Florentines would have stood at his discretion. Sforza had the Bracceschi always against him, so they watched each other. Francesco turned his ambition to Lombardy, Braccio against the church and the kingdom of Naples. But let us come to that which happened a short while ago. The Florentines appointed as their captain Pagolo Vitelli, a most prudent man, who, from a private position, had risen to the greatest renown. If this man had taken Pisa, nobody can deny that it would have been proper for the Florentines to keep in with him, for if he became the soldier of their enemies, they had no means of resisting, and if they held to him, they must obey him. The Venetians, if their achievements are considered, will be seen to have acted safely and gloriously so long as they sent to war their own men, when with armed gentlemen and plebeians they did valiantly. This was before they turned to enterprises on land, but when they began to fight on land they forsook this virtue and followed the custom of Italy. And in the beginning of their expansion on land, though not having much territory, and because of their great reputation, they had not much to fear from their captains. But when they expanded, as under Carmignuolo, they had a taste of this mistake. For having found him a most valiant man, they beat the Duke of Milan under his leadership, and, on the other hand, knowing how lukewarm he was in the war, they feared they would no longer conquer under him, and for this reason they were not willing, nor were they able, to let him go. And so, not to lose again that which they had acquired, they were compelled, in order to secure themselves, to murder him. They had afterwards for their captains Bartolomeo de Bergamo, Roberto de San Severino, the Count of Pitigliano, and the like, under whom they had to dread loss and not gain, as happened afterwards at Vaila, where in one battle they lost that which in eight hundred years they had acquired with so much trouble because from such arms conquests come but slowly, long delayed and inconsiderable, but the losses sudden and portentous. And as with these examples I have reached Italy, which has been ruled for many years by mercenaries, I wish to discuss them more seriously, in order that, having seen their rise and progress, one may be better prepared to counteract them. You must understand that the empire has recently come to be repudiated in Italy, that the Pope has acquired more temporal power, and that Italy has been divided up into more states, for the reason that many of the great cities took up arms against their nobles, who, formerly favoured by the emperor, were oppressing them, whilst the church was favouring them so as to gain authority in temporal power. In many others their citizens became princes. From this it came to pass that Italy fell partly into the hands of the church and of republics, and, the church consisting of priests and the republic of citizens unaccustomed to arms, both commenced to enlist foreigners. The first who gave renown to this soldiery was Alberigo da Cogno, the Romanian. From the school of this man sprang, among others, Braccio and Sforza, who in their time were the arbiters of Italy. After these came all the other captains, who till now have directed the arms of Italy, and the end of all their valour has been that she has been overrun by Charles, robbed by Louis, ravaged by Ferdinand, and insulted by the Switzers. The principle that has guided them has been, first, to lower the credit of infantry, so that they might increase their own. They did this because, 
subsisting on their pay and without territory, they were unable to support many soldiers, and a few infantry did not give them any authority. So they were led to employ cavalry, with a moderate force of which they were maintained and honoured, and affairs were brought to such a pass that in an army of twenty thousand soldiers there were not to be found two thousand foot-soldiers. They had, besides this, used every art to lessen fatigue and danger to themselves and their soldiers, not killing in the fray, but taking prisoners and liberating without ransom. They did not attack towns at night, nor did the garrisons of the towns attack encampments at night. They did not surround the camp either with stockade or ditch, nor did they campaign in the winter. All these things were permitted by their military rules, and devised by them to avoid, as I have said, both fatigue and dangers. Thus they have brought Italy to slavery and contempt. Chapter 13. Concerning Auxiliaries, Mixed Soldiery, and One's Own auxiliaries which are the other useless arm are employed when a prince is called in with his forces to aid and defend as was done by pope julius in the most recent times for he having in the enterprise against ferrara had poor proof of his mercenaries turned to auxiliaries and stipulated with ferdinand king of spain for his assistance with men and arms these arms may be useful and good in themselves but for him who calls them in they are always disadvantageous for losing one is undone and winning one is their captive and although ancient histories may be full of examples i do not wish to leave this recent one of pope julius the second the peril of which cannot fail to be perceived for he wishing to get ferrara threw himself entirely into the hands of the foreigner but his good fortune brought about a third event so that he did not reap the fruit of his rash choice, because, having his auxiliaries routed at Ravenna, and the Switzers having risen and driven out the conquerors, against all expectation, both his and others, it so came to pass that he did not become prisoner to his enemies, they having fled, or to his auxiliaries, he having conquered by other arms than theirs. The Florentines, being entirely without arms, sent ten thousand Frenchmen to take Pisa, whereby they ran more danger than at any other time of their troubles. The Emperor of Constantinople, to oppose his neighbors, sent ten thousand Turks into Greece, who, on the war being finished, were not willing to quit. This was the beginning of the servitude of Greece to the infidels. Therefore let him who has no desire to conquer make use of these arms, for they are much more hazardous than mercenaries, because with them the ruin is ready made. They are all united, all yield obedience to others. But with mercenaries, when they have conquered, more time and better opportunities are needed to injure you. They are not all of one community. They are found and paid by you, and a third party, which you have made in their head, is not able all at once to assume enough authority to injure you. In conclusion, in mercenaries, dastardy is most dangerous, in auxiliaries, valor. The wise prince, therefore, has always avoided these arms, and turned to his own, and has been willing rather to lose with them than to conquer with the others not deeming that a real victory which is gained with the arms of others. I shall never hesitate to cite Cesare Borgia and his actions. This duke entered the Romagna with auxiliaries, taking there only French soldiers, and with them he captured Imola and Forli. But afterwards, such forces not appearing to him reliable, he turned to mercenaries, discerning less danger in them, and enlisted the Orsini and Vitelli whom presently, on handling and finding them doubtful, unfaithful, and dangerous, he destroyed and turned to his own men. And the difference between one and the other of these forces can easily be seen when one considers the difference there was in the reputation of the duke when he had the French, when he had the Orsini and Vitelli, and when he relied on his own soldiers, on whose fidelity he could always count, and found it ever-increasing. 
he was never esteemed more highly than when every one saw that he was complete master of his own forces. I was not intending to go beyond Italian and recent examples, but I am unwilling to leave out Hiero, the Syracusan, he being one of those I have named above. This man, as I have said, made head of the army by the Syracusans, soon found out that a mercenary soldiery, constituted like our Italian condottieri, was of no use, and it appeared to him that he would neither keep them nor let them go. He had them all cut to pieces, and afterwards made war with his own forces and not with aliens. I wish also to recall to memory an instance from the Old Testament applicable to the subject. David offered himself to Saul to fight with Goliath, the Philistine champion, and to give him courage, Saul armed him with his own weapons, which David rejected as soon as he had them on his back, saying he would make no use of them, and that he wished to meet the enemy with his sling and his knife. In conclusion, the arms of others either fall from your back, or they weigh you down, or they bind you fast. Charles the Seventh, the father of King Louis the Eleventh, having by good fortune and valour liberated France from the English, recognised the necessity of being armed with forces of his own, and he established in his kingdom ordinances concerning men-at-arms and infantry. Afterwards his son, King Louis, abolished the infantry and began to enlist the Switzers, which mistake, followed by others, is, as is now seen, a source of peril to that kingdom because, having raised the reputation of the Switzers, he has entirely diminished the value of his own arms, for he has destroyed the infantry altogether, and his men-at-arms he has subordinated to others, for, being as they are so accustomed to fight along with Switzers, it does not appear that they can now conquer without them. Hence it arises that the French cannot stand against the Switzers, and without the Switzers they do not come off well against others. The armies of the French have thus become mixed, partly mercenary and partly national, both of which arms together are much better than mercenaries alone or auxiliaries alone, but much inferior to one's own forces. And this example proves it, for the kingdom of France would be unconquerable if the ordinance of Charles had been enlarged or maintained. But the scanty wisdom of man on entering into an affair which looks well at first cannot discern the poison that is hidden in it, as I have said before of hectic fevers. Therefore, if he who rules a principality cannot recognize evils until they are upon him, he is not truly wise, and this insight is given to few. And if the first disaster to the Roman Empire should be examined, it will be found to have commenced only with the enlisting of the Goths, because from that time the vigor of the Roman Empire began to decline, and all that valor which had raised it passed away to others. I conclude, therefore, that no principality is secure without having its own forces. On the contrary, it is entirely dependent on good fortune, not having the valor which in adversity would defend it and it has always been the opinion and judgment of wise men that nothing can be so uncertain or unstable as fame or power not founded on its own strength. And one's own forces are those which are composed either of subjects, citizens, or dependents. All others are mercenaries or auxiliaries. And the way to make ready one's own forces will easily be found if the rules suggested by me shall be reflected upon, and if one will consider how Philip, the father of Alexander the Great, and many republics and princes have armed and organized themselves, to which rules I entirely commit myself. End of Part 3this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld. Chapter 14. That which concerns a prince on the subject of the art of war. A prince ought to have no other aim or thought, nor select anything else for his study, than war, 
and its rules and discipline. For this is the sole art that belongs to him who rules, and it is of such force that it not only upholds those who are born princes, but it often enables men to rise from a private station to that rank. And on the contrary, it is seen that when princes have thought more of ease than of arms, they have lost their states. And the first cause of your losing it is to neglect this art, and what enables you to acquire a state is to be a master of the art. Francesco Sforza, through being marshal, from a private person became Duke of Milan, and the sons, through avoiding the hardships and troubles of arms, from dukes became private persons. For among other evils which being unarmed brings you, it causes you to be despised, and this is one of those ignominies against which a prince ought to guard himself, as is shown later on. Because there is nothing proportionate between the armed and the unarmed, and it is not reasonable that he who is armed should yield obedience willingly to him who is unarmed, or that the unarmed man should be secure among armed servants because there being in the one disdain and in the other suspicion it is not possible for them to work well together and therefore a prince who does not understand the art of war over and above the other misfortunes already mentioned cannot be respected by his soldiers nor can he rely on them he ought never therefore to have out of his thoughts this subject of war and in peace he should addict himself more to its exercise than in war. This he can do in two ways, the one by action, the other by study. As regards action, he ought above all things to keep his men well organized and drilled, to follow incessantly the chase, by which he accustoms his body to hardships and learns something of the nature of localities, and gets to find out how the mountains rise, how the valleys open out, how the plains lie, and to understand the nature of rivers and marches, and in all this to take the greatest care. Which knowledge is useful in two ways. Firstly, he learns to know his country, and is better able to undertake its defence. Afterwards, by means of the knowledge and observation of that locality, he understands with ease any other which it may be necessary for him to study hereafter because the hills, valleys, and plains, and rivers, and marches that are, for instance, in Tuscany, have a certain resemblance to those of other countries, so that with a knowledge of the aspect of one country one can easily arrive at a knowledge of others. And the prince that lacks this skill lacks the essential which it is desirable that a captain should possess, for it teaches him to surprise his enemy, to select quarters, to lead armies, to array the battle, to besiege towns to advantage. Philopemen, prince of the Achaeans, among other praises which writers have bestowed on him, is commended because in time of peace he never had anything in his mind but the rules of war, and when he was in the country with friends he often stopped and reasoned with them. If the enemy should be upon that hill, and we should find ourselves here with our army, with whom would be the advantage? how would one best advance to meet him, keeping the ranks? If we should wish to retreat, how ought we to pursue? And he would set forth to them, as he went, all the chances that could befall an army. He would listen to their opinion, and state his, confirming it with reasons, so that by these continual discussions there could never arise, in time of war, any unexpected circumstances that he could not deal with but to exercise the intellect the prince should read histories and study there the actions of illustrious men to see how they have borne themselves in war to examine the causes of their victories and defeat so as to avoid the latter and imitate the former and above all do as an illustrious man did who took as an exemplar one who had been praised and famous before him and whose achievements and deeds he always kept in his mind as it is said alexander the great imitated achilles caesar alexander Scipio cyrus and whoever reads the life of cyrus written by xenophon will recognize afterwards in the life of Scipio how that imitation was his glory and how in chastity affability humanity and liberality 
Scipio conformed to those things which have been written of Cyrus by Xenophon. A wise prince ought to observe some such rules, and never in peaceful time stand idle, but increase his resources with industry in such a way that they may be available to him in adversity, so that if fortune chances it may find him prepared to resist her blows. Chapter 15 Concerning Things for Which Men, and Especially Princes, Are Praised or Blamed it remains now to see what ought to be the rules of conduct for a prince toward subject and friends and as i know that many have written on this point i expect i shall be considered presumptuous in mentioning it again especially as in discussing it i shall depart from the methods of other people but it being my intention to write a thing which shall be useful to him who apprehends it it appears to me more appropriate to follow up the real truth of the matter than the imagination of it. For many have pictured republics and principalities which in fact have never been known or seen, because how one lives is so far distant from how one ought to live, that he who neglects what is done for what ought to be done sooner affects his ruin than his preservation. For a man who wishes to act entirely up to his professions of virtue soon meets with what destroys him among so much that is evil. Hence it is necessary for a prince wishing to hold his own to know how to do wrong, and to make use of it or not according to necessity. Therefore, putting on one side imaginary things concerning a prince, and discussing those which are real, I say that all men, when they are spoken of, and chiefly princes, for being more highly placed, are remarkable for some of those qualities which bring them either blame or praise. And thus it is that one is reputed liberal, another miserly, using a Tuscan term, because an avaricious person in our language is still he who desires to possess by robbery, whilst we call one miserly who deprives himself too much of the use of his own one is reputed generous, one rapacious, one cruel, one compassionate, one faithless, another faithful, one effeminate and cowardly, another bold and brave, one affable, another haughty, one lascivious, another chaste, one sincere, another cunning, one hard, another easy, one grave, another frivolous, one religious, another unbelieving, and the like and i know that every one will confess that it would be most praiseworthy in a prince to exhibit all the above qualities that are considered good but because they can neither be entirely possessed nor observed for human conditions do not permit it it is necessary for him to be sufficiently prudent that he may know how to avoid the reproach of those vices which would lose him his state and also to keep himself if it be possible from those which would not lose him it but this not being possible he may with less hesitation abandon himself to them and again he need not make himself uneasy at incurring a reproach for those vices without which the state can only be saved with difficulty for if everything is considered carefully it will be found that something which looks like virtue if followed would be his ruin whilst something else which looks like vice yet followed brings him security and prosperity chapter sixteen concerning liberality and meanness commencing then with the first of the above-named characteristics i say that it would be well to be reputed liberal Nevertheless, liberality, exercised in a way that does not bring you the reputation for it, injures you. For if one exercises it honestly, and as it should be exercised, it may not become known, and you will not avoid the reproach of its opposite. Therefore, any one wishing to maintain among men the name of liberal is obliged to avoid no attribute of magnificence so that a prince thus inclined will consume in such acts all his property, and will be compelled in the end, if he wish to maintain the name of liberal, to unduly weigh down his people, and tax them, and do everything he can to get money. This will soon make him odious to his subjects, and becoming poor he will be little valued by any one. 
thus with his liberality having offended many and rewarded few he is affected by the very first trouble and imperiled by whatever may be the first danger recognizing this himself and wishing to draw back from it he runs at once into the reproach of being miserly therefore a prince not being able to exercise this virtue of liberality in such a way that it is recognized except to his cost if he is wise he ought not to fear the reputation of being mean for in time he will come to be more considered than if liberal seeing that with his economy his revenues are enough that he can defend himself against all attacks and is able to engage in enterprises without burdening his people thus it comes to pass that he exercises liberality towards all from whom he does not take who are numberless and meanness towards those to whom he does not give who are few we have not seen great things done in our time except by those who have been considered mean the rest have failed pope julius the second was assisted in reaching the papacy by the reputation for liberality yet he did not strive afterwards to keep it up when he made war on the king of france and he made many wars without imposing any extraordinary tax on his subjects for he supplied his additional expenses out of his own thriftiness the present king of Spain would not have undertaken or conquered in so many enterprises if he had been reputed liberal. A prince, therefore, provided that he has not to rob his subjects, that he can defend himself, that he does not become poor and abject, that he is not forced to become rapacious, ought to hold of little account a reputation for being mean, for it is one of those vices which will enable him to govern and if any one should say caesar obtained empire by liberality and many others have reached the highest positions by being liberal and by being considered so i answer either you are a prince in fact or in a way to become one in the first case this liberality is dangerous in the second it is very necessary to be considered liberal and caesar was one of those who wished to become preeminent in rome but if he had survived after becoming so, and had not moderated his expenses, he would have destroyed his government. And if any one should reply, Many have been princes, and have done great things with armies who have been considered very liberal, I reply, Either a prince spends that which is his own, or his subjects, or else that of others. In the first case he ought to be sparing in the second he ought not to neglect any opportunity for liberality and the prince who goes forth with his army supporting it by pillage sack and extortion handling that which belongs to others this liberality is necessary otherwise he would not be followed by soldiers and of that which is neither yours nor your subjects you can be a ready giver as were cyrus caesar and alexander because it does not take away your reputation if you squander that of others but adds to it it is only squandering your own that injures you and there is nothing wastes so rapidly as liberality for even whilst you exercise it you lose the power to do so and so become either poor or despised or else in avoiding poverty rapacious and hated and a prince should guard himself above all things against being despised and hated and liberality leads you to both therefore it is wiser to have a reputation for meanness which brings reproach without hatred than to be compelled through seeking a reputation for liberality to incur a name for rapacity which begets reproach with hatred chapter seventeen concerning cruelty and clemency and whether it is better to be loved than feared coming now to the other qualities mentioned above i say that every prince ought to desire to be considered clement and not cruel nevertheless he ought to take care not to misuse this clemency cesare borgia was considered cruel notwithstanding his cruelty reconciled the romagna unified it and restored it to peace and loyalty and if this be rightly considered he will be seen to have been much more merciful than the florentine people who to avoid a reputation for cruelty 
permitted Pistoia to be destroyed. Therefore a prince, so long as he keeps his subjects united and loyal, ought not to mind the reproach of cruelty, because, with a few examples, he will be more merciful than those who, through too much mercy, allow disorders to arise, from which follow murders or robberies. For these are wont to injure the whole people, whilst those executions which originate with a prince offend the individual only. And of all princes, it is impossible for the new prince to avoid the imputation of cruelty, owing to new states being full of dangers. Hence Virgil, through the mouth of Dido, excuses the inhumanity of her reign owing to its being new, saying, Nevertheless he ought to be slow to believe and to act, nor should he himself show fear, but proceed in a temperate manner with prudence and humanity, so that too much confidence may not make him incautious, and too much distrust render him intolerable. Upon this a question arises, whether it be better to be loved than feared, or feared than loved. It may be answered that one should wish to be both, but because it is difficult to unite them in one person, it is much safer to be feared than loved, when, of the two, either must be dispensed with because this is to be asserted in general of men, that they are ungrateful, fickle, false, cowardly, covetous, and as long as you succeed they are yours entirely. They will offer you their blood, property, life, and children, as is said above, when the need is far distant, but when it approaches they turn against you and that prince who, relying entirely on their promises, has neglected other precautions, is ruined, because friendships that are obtained by payments, and not by greatness or nobility of mind, may indeed be earned, but they are not secured, and in time of need cannot be relied upon. And men have less scruple in offending one who is beloved than one who is feared, for love is preserved by the link of obligation which, owing to the baseness of men, is broken at every opportunity for their advantage. But fear preserves you by a dread of punishment which never fails. Nevertheless, a prince ought to inspire fear in such a way that, if he does not win love, he avoids hatred, because he can endure very well being feared whilst he is not hated which will always be as long as he abstains from the property of his citizens and subjects, and from their women. But when it is necessary for him to proceed against the life of some one, he must do it on proper justification and for manifest cause, but above all things he must keep his hands off the property of others, because men more quickly forget the death of their father than the loss of their patrimony. Besides, pretexts for taking away the property are never wanting, for he who has once begun to live by robbery will always find pretexts for seizing what belongs to others. But reasons for taking life, on the contrary, are more difficult to find and sooner lapse. But when a prince is with his army and has under control a multitude of soldiers, then it is quite necessary for him to disregard the reputation for cruelty for without it he would never hold his army united or disposed to its duties. Among the wonderful deeds of Hannibal this one is enumerated, that having led an enormous army, composed of many various races of men, to fight in foreign lands, no dissensions arose either among them or against the prince, whether in his bad or in his good fortune. This arose from nothing else than his inhuman cruelty which, with his boundless valour, made him revered and terrible in the sight of his soldiers, but without that cruelty his other virtues were not sufficient to produce this effect, and short-sighted riders admire his deeds from one point of view, and from another condemn the principal cause of them. That it is true his other virtues would not have been sufficient for him may be proved by the case of Scipio, that most excellent man, not only of his own times, but within the memory of man, against whom, nevertheless, his army rebelled in Spain. This arose from nothing but his too great forbearance, 
which gave his soldiers more license than is consistent with military discipline. For this he was upbraided in the Senate by Fabius Maximus, and called the corrupter of the Roman soldiery. The Locrians were laid waste by a legate of Scipio, yet they were not avenged by him, nor was the insolence of the legate punished, owing entirely to his easy nature, insomuch that some one in the Senate, wishing to excuse him, said there were many men who know much better how not to err than to correct the errors of others. This disposition, if he had been continued in the command, would have destroyed in time the fame and glory of Scipio. But, he being under the control of the Senate, this injurious characteristic not only concealed itself, but contributed to his glory. Returning to the question of being feared or loved, I come to the conclusion that men loving according to their own will and fearing according to that of the prince, a wise prince should establish himself on that which is in his own control, and not in that of others. He must endeavor only to avoid hatred, as is noted. End of Part 4《Part V of The Prince》by Niccolò Machiavelli, translated by W. K. Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Newfound. Chapter Eighteen, concerning the way in which princes should keep faith. Every one admits how praiseworthy it is in a prince to keep faith and to live with integrity and not with craft. Nevertheless, our experience has been that those princes who have done great things have held good faith of little account, and have known how to circumvent the intellect of men by craft, and in the end have overcome those who have relied on their word. You must know that there are two ways of contesting, the one by the law, the other by force. The first method is proper to men, the second to beasts but because the first is frequently not sufficient, it is necessary to have recourse to the second. Therefore it is necessary for a prince to understand how to avail himself of the beast and the man. This has been figuratively taught to princes by ancient writers, who describe how Achilles and many other princes of old were given to the centaur Chiron to nurse, who brought them up in his discipline, which means solely that, as they had for a teacher one who was half beast and half man, so it is necessary for a prince to know how to make use of both natures, and that one without the other is not durable. A prince, therefore, being compelled knowingly to adopt the beast, ought to choose the fox and the lion, because the lion cannot defend himself against snares, and the fox cannot defend himself against wolves. Therefore it is necessary to be a fox to discover the snares, and a lion to terrify the wolves. Those who rely simply on the lion do not understand what they are about. Therefore a wise lord cannot, nor ought he to, keep faith when such observance may be turned against him, and when the reasons that cause him to pledge it exist no longer. If men were entirely good, this precept would not hold but because they are bad, and will not keep faith with you, you too are not bound to observe it with them. Nor will there ever be wanting to a prince legitimate reasons to excuse this non-observance. Of this, endless modern examples could be given, showing how many treaties and engagements have been made void and of no effect through the faithlessness of princes, and he who has known best how to employ the fox has succeeded best. But it is necessary to know well how to disguise this characteristic, and to be a great pretender and dissembler, and men are so simple and so subject to present necessities that he who seeks to deceive will always find some one who will allow himself to be deceived. One recent example I cannot pass over in silence. Alexander the Sixth did nothing else but deceive men, nor ever thought of doing otherwise, and he always found victims. 
for there never was a man who had greater power in asserting or with greater oaths would affirm a thing yet would observe it less nevertheless his deceits always succeeded according to his wishes because he well understood this side of mankind therefore it is unnecessary for a prince to have all the good qualities i have enumerated but it is very necessary to appear to have them and i shall dare to say this also that to have them and always to observe them is injurious and that to appear to have them is useful to appear merciful faithful humane religious upright and to be so but with a mind so framed that should you require not to be so you may be able and know how to change to the opposite and you have to understand this that a prince especially a new one cannot observe all these things for which men are esteemed being often forced in order to maintain the state to act contrary to fidelity friendship humanity and religion therefore it is necessary for him to have a mind ready to turn itself accordingly as the winds and variations of fortune force it yet as i have said before not to diverge from the good if he can avoid doing so but if compelled then to know how to set about it for this reason a prince ought to take care that he never lets anything slip from his lips that is not replete with the above-named five qualities that he may appear to him who sees and hears him altogether merciful faithful humane upright and religious there is nothing more necessary to appear to have than this last quality inasmuch as men judge generally more by the eye than by the hand because it belongs to everybody to see you to few to come in touch with you every one sees what you appear to be few really know what you are and those few dare not oppose themselves to the opinion of the many who have the majesty of the state to defend them and in the actions of all men and especially of princes which it is not prudent to challenge one judges by the result for that reason let a prince have the credit for a conquering and holding his state the means will always be considered honest and he will be praised by everybody because the vulgar are always taken by what a thing seems to be and by what comes of it and in the world there are only the vulgar for the few find a place there only when the many have no ground to rest on one prince of the present time whom it is not well to name never preaches anything else but peace and good faith and to both he is most hostile and either if he had kept it would have deprived him of reputation and kingdom many a time chapter nineteen that one should avoid being despised and hated now concerning the characteristics of which mention is made above i have spoken of the more important ones the others i wish to discuss briefly under this generality that the prince must consider as has been in part said before how to avoid those things which will make him hated or contemptible and as often as he shall have succeeded he will have fulfilled his part and he need not fear any danger in other reproaches it makes him hated above all things as i have said to be rapacious and to be a violator of the property and women of his subjects from both of which he must abstain and when neither their property nor their honour is touched the majority of men live content and he has only to contend with the ambition of a few whom he can curb with ease in many ways it makes him contemptible to be considered fickle frivolous effeminate mean-spirited irresolute from all of which a prince should guard himself as from a rock and he should endeavour to show in his actions greatness courage gravity and fortitude and in his private dealings with his subjects let him show that his judgments are irrevocable and maintain himself in such reputation that no one can hope either to deceive him or to get round him the prince is highly esteemed who conveys this impression of himself 
and he who is highly esteemed is not easily conspired against for provided it is well known that he is an excellent man and revered by his people he can only be attacked with difficulty for this reason a prince ought to have two fears one from within on account of his subjects the other from without on account of external powers from the latter he is defended by being well armed and having good allies and if he is well armed he will have good friends and affairs will always remain quiet within when they are quiet without unless they should have been already disturbed by conspiracy and even should affairs outside be disturbed if he has carried out his preparations and has lived as i have said as long as he does not despair he will resist every attack as i said nabis the spartan did but concerning his subjects when affairs outside are disturbed he has only to fear that they will conspire secretly from which a prince can easily secure himself by avoiding being hated and despised and by keeping the people satisfied with him which it is most necessary for him to accomplish as i said above at length and one of the most efficacious remedies that a prince can have against conspiracies is not to be hated and despised by the people for he who conspires against a prince always expects to please them by his removal but when the conspirator can only look forward to offending them he will not have the courage to take such a course for the difficulties that confront a conspirator are infinite and as experience shows many have been the conspiracies but few have been successful because he who conspires cannot act alone nor can he take a companion except from those whom he believes to be malcontents and as soon as you have opened your mind to a malcontent you have given him the material with which to content himself for by denouncing you he can look for every advantage so that seeing the gain from this course to be assured and seeing the other to be doubtful and full of dangers he must be a very rare friend or a thoroughly obstinate enemy of the prince to keep faith with you and to reduce the matter into a small compass i say that on the side of the conspirator there is nothing but fear jealousy prospect of punishment to terrify him but on the side of the prince there is the majesty of the principality the laws the protection of friends and the state to defend him so that adding to all these things the popular good will it is impossible that any one should be so rash as to conspire for whereas in general the conspirator has to fear before the execution of his plot in this case he has also to fear the sequel to the crime because on account of it he has the people for an enemy and thus cannot hope for any escape endless examples could be given on this subject but i will be content with one brought to pass within the memory of our fathers messer annibale bentivogli who was prince in bologna grandfather of the present annibale having been murdered by the caneschi who had conspired against him not one of his family survived but messer giovanni who was in childhood immediately after his assassination the people rose and murdered all the caneschi this sprung from the popular good will which the house of bentivogli enjoyed in those days in bologna which was so great that although none remained there after the death of annibale who was able to rule the state the bolognese having information that there was one of the bentivogli family in florence who up to that time had been considered the son of a blacksmith sent to florence for him and gave him the government of their city and it was ruled by him until messer giovanni came in due course to the government for this reason i consider that a prince ought to reckon conspiracies of little account when his people hold him in esteem but when it is hostile to him and bears hatred towards him he ought to fear everything and everybody and well-ordered states and wise princes have taken every care not to drive the nobles to desperation and to keep the people satisfied and contented for this is one of the most important objects a prince can have 
among the best ordered and governed kingdoms of our times is france and in it are found many good institutions on which depend the liberty and security of the king of these the first is the parliament and its authority because he who founded the kingdom knowing the ambition of the nobility and their boldness considered that a bit to their mouths would be necessary to hold them in and on the other side knowing the hatred of the people founded in fear against the nobles he wished to protect them yet he was not anxious for this to be the particular care of the king therefore to take away the reproach which he would be liable to from the nobles by favouring the people and from the people for favouring the nobles he set up an arbiter who should be one who could beat down the great and favour the lesser without approach to the king neither could you have a better or a more prudent arrangement or a greater source of security to the king and kingdom from this one can draw another important conclusion that princes ought to leave affairs of reproach to the management of others and keep those of grace in their own hands and further i consider that a prince ought to cherish the nobles but not so as to make himself hated by the people it may appear perhaps to some who have examined the lives and deaths of the roman emperors that many of them would be an example contrary to my opinion seeing that some of them lived nobly and showed great qualities of soul nevertheless they have lost their empire or have been killed by subjects who have conspired against them wishing therefore to answer these objections i will recall the characteristics of some of the emperors and will show that the causes of their ruin were not different to those alleged by me at the same time i will only submit for consideration those things that are noteworthy to him who studies the affairs of those times it seems to me sufficient to take all those emperors who succeeded to the empire after marcus the philosopher down to maximinus they were marcus and his son commodus pertinax julian severus and his son antoninus caracalla macrinus heliogabalus alexander and maximinus there is first to note that whereas in other principalities the ambition of the nobles and the insolence of the people only have to be contended with the roman emperors had a third difficulty in having to put up with the cruelty and avarice of their soldiers a matter so beset with difficulties that it was the ruin of many for it was a hard thing to give satisfaction both to soldiers and people because the people loved peace and for this reason they loved the unaspiring prince whilst the soldiers loved the warlike prince who was bold cruel and rapacious which qualities they were quite willing he should exercise upon the people so that they could get double pay and give vent to their own greed and cruelty hence it arose that those emperors were always overthrown who either by birth or training had no great authority and most of them especially those who came new to the principality recognizing the difficulty of these two opposing humours were inclined to give satisfaction to the soldiers caring little about injuring the people which course was necessary because as princes cannot help being hated by some one they ought in the first place to avoid being hated by every one and when they cannot compass this they ought to endeavour with the utmost diligence to avoid the hatred of the most powerful therefore those emperors who through inexperience had need of special favour adhered more readily to the soldiers than to the people a course which turned out advantageous to them or not accordingly as the prince knew how to maintain authority over them from these causes it arose that marcus pertinax and alexander being all men of modest life lovers of justice enemies to cruelty humane and benignant came to a sad end except marcus he alone lived and died honoured because he had succeeded to the throne by hereditary title and owed nothing either to the soldiers or the people and afterwards being possessed of many virtues which made him respected he always kept both orders in their places whilst he lived and was neither hated nor despised 
but Pertinax was created emperor against the wishes of the soldiers, who, being accustomed to live licentiously under Commodus, could not endure the honest life to which Pertinax wished to reduce them. Thus, having given cause for hatred, to which hatred there was added contempt for his old age, he was overthrown at the very beginning of his administration and here it should be noted that hatred is acquired as much by good works as by bad ones therefore as i said before a prince wishing to keep his state is very often forced to do evil for when that body is corrupt whom you think you have need of to maintain yourself it may be either the people or the soldiers or the nobles you have to submit to its humours and to gratify them and then good works will do you harm but let us come to alexander who was a man of such great goodness that among the other praises which are accorded him is this that in the fourteen years he held the empire no one was ever put to death by him unjudged nevertheless being considered effeminate and a man who allowed himself to be governed by his mother he became despised the army conspired against him and murdered him turning now to the opposite characters of commodus severus antoninus caracalla and maximinus we will find them all cruel and rapacious men who to satisfy their soldiers did not hesitate to commit every kind of iniquity against the people and all except severus came to a bad end but in Severus there was so much valour that, keeping the soldiers friendly, although the people were oppressed by him, he reigned successfully, for his valour made him so much admired in the sight of the soldiers and people that the latter were kept in a way astonished and awed, and the former respectful and satisfied. And because the actions of this man, as a new prince, were great, I wish to show briefly that he knew well how to counterfeit the fox and the lion, which natures, as I said above, it is necessary for a prince to imitate. Knowing the sloth of the Emperor Julian, he persuaded the army in Sclavonia, of which he was captain, that it would be right to go to Rome and avenge the death of Pertinax, who had been killed by the Praetorian soldiers and under this pretext without appearing to aspire to the throne he moved the army on rome and reached italy before it was known that he had started on his arrival at rome the senate through fear elected him emperor and killed julian after this there remained for severus who wished to make himself master of the whole empire one in asia where niger head of the asiatic army had caused himself to be claimed emperor, and the other in the west, where Albinus was, who also aspired to the throne. And as he considered it dangerous to declare himself hostile to both, he decided to attack Niger, and to deceive Albinus. To the latter he wrote that, being elected emperor by the senate, he was willing to share that dignity with him, and sent him the title of Caesar and moreover that the senate had made albinus his colleague which things were accepted by albinus as true but after severus had conquered and killed niger and settled oriental affairs he returned to rome and complained to the senate that albinus little recognizing the benefits that he had received from him had by treachery sought to murder him and for this ingratitude he was compelled to punish him afterwards he sought him out in france and took from him his government and life he who will therefore carefully examine the actions of this man will find him a most valiant lion and a most cunning fox he will find him feared and respected by every one and not hated by the army and it need not be wondered at that he a new man was able to hold the empire so well because his supreme renown always protected him from that hatred which the people might have conceived against him for his violence. But his son, Antoninus, was a most eminent man, and had very excellent qualities, which made him admirable in the sight of the people and acceptable to the soldiers, for he was a warlike man, most enduring of fatigue, a despiser of all delicate food and other luxuries 
which caused him to be loved by the armies. Nevertheless, his ferocity and cruelties were so great and so unheard of that after endless single murders he killed a large number of people of Rome and all those of Alexandria. He became hated by the whole world and also feared by those he had around him, to such an extent that he was murdered in the midst of his army by a centurion. And here it must be noted that such like deaths, which are deliberately inflicted with a resolved and desperate courage, cannot be avoided by princes, because any one who does not fear to die can inflict them. But a prince may fear them the less, because they are very rare. He has only to be careful not to do any grave injury to those whom he employs or has around him in the service of the state. Antoninus had not taken this care, but had contumeliously killed a brother of that centurion, whom he also daily threatened, yet retained in his bodyguard, which, as it turned out, was a rash thing to do, and proved the emperor's ruin. But let us come to Commodus, to whom it should have been very easy to hold the empire, for, being the son of Marcus, he had inherited it and he had only to follow in the footsteps of his father to please his people and soldiers. But being by nature cruel and brutal, he gave himself up to amusing the soldiers and corrupting them, so that he might indulge his rapacity upon the people. On the other hand, not maintaining his dignity, often descending to the theatre to compete with gladiators, and doing other vile things, little worthy of the imperial majesty, he fell into contempt with the soldiers, and being hated by one party and despised by the other, he was conspired against and was killed. It remains to discuss the character of Maximinus. He was a very warlike man, and the armies, being disgusted with the effeminacy of Alexander, of whom I have already spoken, killed him and elected Maximinus to the throne. This he did not possess for long for two things made him hated and despised. The one, his having kept sheep in Thrace, which brought him into contempt, it being well known to all and considered a great indignity by everyone, and the other, his having at the accession to his dominions deferred going to Rome and taking possession of the imperial seat. He had also gained a reputation for the utmost ferocity by having, through his prefects in Rome and elsewhere in the empire, practised many cruelties, so that the whole world was moved to anger at the meanness of his birth, and to fear at his barbarity. First Africa rebelled, then the Senate with all the people of Rome, and all Italy conspired against him, to which may be added his own army. This latter, besieging Aquileia and meeting with difficulties in taking it, were disgusted with his cruelties, and fearing him less when they found so many against him, murdered him. I do not wish to discuss Heliogabalus, Macrinus, or Julian, who, being thoroughly contemptible, were quickly wiped out. But I will bring this discourse to a conclusion by saying that princes in our own times have this difficulty of giving inordinate satisfaction to their soldiers in a far less degree, because, notwithstanding, one has to give them some indulgence, that is soon done none of these princes have armies that are veterans in the governance and administration of provinces as were the armies of the roman empire and whereas it was then more necessary to give satisfaction to the soldiers than to the people it is now more necessary to all princes except the turk and the soldan to satisfy the people rather than the soldiers because the people are the more powerful from the above i have accepted the turk who always keeps round him twelve thousand infantry and fifteen thousand cavalry, on which depend the security and strength of the kingdom, and it is necessary that, putting aside every consideration for the people, he should keep them his friends. The kingdom of the Soldan is similar. Being entirely in the hands of soldiers, it follows again that, without regard to the people, he must keep them his friends but you must note that the state of the soldan is unlike all other principalities for the reason that it is like the christian pontificate which cannot be called either an hereditary or a newly formed principality 
because the sons of the old prince are not the heirs, but he who is elected to that position by those who have authority, and the sons remain only noblemen. And this being an ancient custom, it cannot be called a new principality, because there are none of those difficulties in it that are met with in new ones. For although the prince is new, the constitution of the state is old, and it is framed so as to receive him as if he were its hereditary lord. But, returning to the subject of our discourse, I say that whoever will consider it will acknowledge that either hatred or contempt has been fatal to the above-named emperors, and it will be recognized also how it happened that a number of them acting in one way and a number in another, only one in each way came to a happy end and the rest to unhappy ones. Because it would have been useless and dangerous for Pertinax and Alexander, being new princes, to imitate Marcus, who was heir to the principality, and likewise it would have been utterly destructive to Caracalla, Commodus, and Maximinus to have imitated Severus, they not having sufficient valour to enable them to tread in his footsteps. Therefore, a prince, new to the principality, cannot imitate the actions of Marcus, nor, again, is it necessary to follow those of Severus, but he ought to take from Severus those parts which are necessary to found his state, and from Marcus those which are proper and glorious, to keep a state that may already be stable and firm. End of Part 5